Welcome to everyone here today. I'm still in the place where I, when I see actual people in the audience, it just makes me smile. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for What the Eyes Don't See, stories from the front lines of the Flint water crisis. I am Rebecca Mark, director of the Institute for Women's Leadership, and on behalf of the Institute and Rutgers University, I am pleased to welcome you to the Anita Ashok Datar Lecture on Women's Global Health. As you could no doubt tell in watching the short video that opened our program, we are extremely proud to be the home of the Anita Ashok Datar Lecture Series. This is truly a collaborative initiative, and we are grateful to our university co-sponsors, Rutgers Global, and the Innovation Design Entrepreneurship Academy. We thank the generous donors who make this event possible, and the event team who does the work to make it happen. Emily Heron, Lisa Hetfield, and Greg Costales. You, you, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, we are delighted to welcome you to Rutgers as our special guest this evening, and we look forward to your conversation with Mary O'Dowd. You tell us in your book that the name Mona means hope, wish, or desire. You have brought hope to the people of Flint and allowed us to dare, to dare to wish for a cleaner, more sustainable planet. I have been a fangirl for years and am thrilled that you are here today. For those who may not know about us, the Institute for Women's Leadership is a consortium of 10 independent units at Rutgers, New Brunswick, dedicated to the study of women and gender, to advocacy on behalf of gender equity, and to the promotion of women's leadership locally, nationally, and globally. We work together to advance a new vision of leadership, one dedicated to collective action for a more just and sustainable world. Before I present Sidi Shah, who will be introducing our program, I want to give a special welcome to the family and friends of Anita Ashok Datar, who are with us this evening. Today, we are being reminded to look beyond the easily recognizable to that which lies beneath. Anita came to her work because of her compassion for those living without the technologies of the modern world. She speaks of, quote, the still vivid memory attending the birth of an infant in a remote village in Senegal. There is the memory of my feeling of powerlessness in the face of her resilience as she struggled to birth her baby at a facility in the midst of chaos. Anita's eyes brought compassion and understanding to this moment. Anita saw not just the mother's resilience, but in life's work. We are honored to partner with you to celebrate Anita's life and leadership. Through this annual lecture in her name, we hope to expand understanding of women's global health challenges and to inspire the next generation of passionate change makers like Anita. Now, I am delighted to introduce Sidi Shah, an IWL leadership scholar. Sidi is a cell biology and neuroscience major and a women's gender and sexuality studies minor. On campus, she is the president of the chapter of Cares Kids, a pediatric cancer nonprofit organization. 
passionate about health education and equity, CD conducts research on health disparities in women veterans at Stanford University and has worked to improve health access for asylum seekers at the Libertas Center for Human Rights. She is also, believe it or not, the author of the children's book, quote, How to Become a Neuro Nerd. In, in the future, CD aspires to become a physician who utilizes the power of education and advocacy. CD, and I'd like to invite Mona and Mary to the stage. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for the introduction. And thank you to everyone joining us here this evening. Every day, each one of us is faced with countless choices. Some place us within our comfort zones, but others are risks that allow us to venture into the unknown. So as we sit here today in the midst of current and future leaders, activists, and trailblazers, I invite everyone to consider what makes a risk worth taking? As a student who aspires to become a physician that advocates for those with marginalized identities, I have come to value risks that are selfless. I want to take risks that uplift others and push us towards a more fair and equitable society. At the Institute of Women's Leadership, I am encouraged to put risk-taking for social justice into action. All of us in attendance here tonight are incredibly fortunate to be able to hear from two leaders who embody this spirit in all the work that they do. When pediatrician turned detective, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, ran tests on the blood lead levels of her patients in Flint, Michigan, she quickly realized that something was wrong. She had cold, hard proof of a government poisoning its children. Faced with a monumental decision, Dr. Hannah Atisha took a risk. The risk of exposing the truth. The risk of fighting back. The risk of exposing yourself up to backlash to advance the greater good. Her years of relentless activism rooted in irrefutable science brought national attention to the Flint water crisis and the health of our nation's future. And I am honored to introduce her here today. Aww, thank you. Amazing. <laughs> thank you. The author of the acclaimed book, What the Eyes Don't See, a story of crisis, resistance, and hope in an American city, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha has been recognized at Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. She is a C.S. Ma Endowed Professor of Public Health at Michigan State University, College of Human Medicine, and founding director at the Pediatric Public Health Initiative. She serves on several, several boards to advance the causes of health equity and social justice, including the Flint Child Health Development Fund and Physicians for Human Rights. Today, she will be in conversation with Mary O'Dowd, the Executive Director of Health Systems and Population Health Integration for Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences. She's co-editor of the book, Junctures in Women's Leadership, Healthcare and Public Health, and the host of the podcast series on the pandemic. She serves on several advisory committees, including the Board of Directors for University Hospital in Newark and the New Jersey Action Coalition. Previously, she served as the commissioner for the New Jersey Department of Health. She is also a former IWL leadership scholar. <laughs> I can't wait to hear from both of these extraordinary women leaders, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha and Mary O'Dowd. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I projected a little too much there. Um, 
for that wonderful introduction. We Amazing. really appreciate it. And Dr. Mona, thank you so much for being here and traveling to New Jersey thank for this you. conversation. It is I, great to be here. You have a lot of fans in the audience. We'll um, do lots of selfies. <laughs> Um, and I already took mine. So. <laughs> um, let's start out for those of us um, in the audience who haven't read your book multiple times, like some of us, um, and had the chance, like I've been able to interview you, to just set the stage a little bit and tell the story. Um, take us back to August 2015, which feels like a lifetime ago, but really wasn't that long ago. Um, and the barbecue at your house, and the conversation with a friend that led to the life-changing direction. What was um, going on in Flint? Yeah, so I'll spend like, like the next couple hours telling the story. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, so it was the late summer of 2015, and a high school girlfriend, so it starts with girlfriends, um, was in town. And we had both been really kind of inspired by environmentalism in high school. Uh, we helped shut down the local incinerator. We were like these little activists. And I went on to do environmental health. And she went on to be an environmental engineer at, at Carnegie Mellon. Later went to work for the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, DC. But she had come back home to Michigan. And she was texting me in the morning. She's like, hey, I'm back. I'm like, oh, what are you doing tonight? Come over. Let's you know, get the kids together. Um, I'm like, my husband will barbecue. Like, come over. You know, Last, last minute, totally last minute plans. Um, so my high school girlfriend comes over and um, we're having a glass of wine because you know girlfriends <laughs> do that. And she's like, Mona, um, the water in Flint. And I'm like, yeah, the water in Flint. Like my, my patients are concerned and, and they're, you know, they're you know, saying that when they bathe their kids in the water, sometimes they'll get like a rash to the water line or they're, they're worried about um, mixing the baby's formula with this water. Um, but I told my friend at, at this barbecue, like, but everybody says it's okay. You know, the folks in charge, the health officers, the water people, the whole state, you know, even though people have concerns, everybody is saying everything is okay. And like in my head, I'm like, a doll, like how can it not be okay? I mean, this is America, it's the 21st century, there's rules and laws and regulations that ensure that our water is safe, right? Okay, and then on top of that, I already did this exercise. Okay, Michigan, this is Michigan. So what's Michigan surrounded by? The Great Lakes, right? <laughs> so the, the Great Lakes, so the largest source of fresh water in the world. 21% of the fresh water in the world, and here's Flint in the middle. And like, like how could our water not be okay? So she's like, Mona, like, um, you know, they, they, the water source was changed. I'm like, yeah, I know the water source was changed. And then she stares at me. And she's like, Mona, they didn't use corrosion control. And I'm like, I didn't learn about that in medical school. Like, what, what does that mean? Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? And she shared that, you know, she saw a memo from a former colleague that she trusted at the EPA. And the water wasn't being treated properly with this really important ingredient called corrosion control. Like I think of it like a medicine that you're supposed to put in the water treatment. And because it wasn't being treated properly, there was gonna be lead in the water. So with a glass of wine in my hand, with my high school girlfriend who I trust, for the very first time, I hear the word lead. And I mean, what do you, what do you think when you hear the word lead? Well, back then or now? now. Like, what, what does anybody think? <laughs> is lead good or bad? Terrible. Terrible. Like, it's the worst. It's like the most well-studied, most potent neurotoxin known. It's a form and of preventable. And preventable. And completely preventable. Completely preventable. It's a form of environmental racism. Like, you know, we've done a better job decreasing lead levels. But, you know, it's, the, it's disparate who bears the shoulder of this burden. Um, and that can, it, there's no safe level. We, we've learned so much about it. Levels we thought that were okay even when I was in training, we now know are not okay. And it can literally alter the life course trajectory of not just a kid, but a population of kids. Um, so that's the moment my, my life changed <laughs> in, in, in my house with my girlfriend from high school, uh, with my kids running around screaming when I heard the word, <laughs> Lead. So that's that's the story. We can end now. <laughs> <laughs> well, so two things. One, back then, it was not well understood that water was a source of yeah. lead poisoning. It was mostly like housing and paint, and that's why all like dust and all yeah. of that. I mean, 
I know when I had kids, that was the issue. You had to test your windows for pain and all of that. So it's a big moment that you're having here because it, you then did something else. So yeah. what did you go do after this conversation? Yeah, so you know, I, as a pediatrician in an urban children's hospital, uh, have cared for hundreds, hundreds of children with acute lead poisoning where they had to be like admitted to the hospital and get like chelation therapy. And always it was paint, 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 dust, 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 like soil, um, mm -hmm. maybe retained bullets that were leaching lead. I've cared for kids who have like been shot and have like lead release from bullets foreign makeup, chemicals, uh, pottery, mm -hmm. like all these random sources. Never in my training did I ever know about the possibility that lead could be in water, which is one of the reasons the book is called What the Eyes Don't See. I never saw it because I didn't know it. Um, but you guys tell me, what's the elemental symbol for lead? PB. Um, and it comes from the Latin plumbum, which means plumbing. So like lead means plumbing. Like I didn't know that. I had no <laughs> idea that lead means plumbing. Um, if anybody goes to like Pompeii, you can see the, like, you can see the lead plumbing still preserved. Um, some of the theories hypothesize the demise of the Romans is because they used so much lead, not just in plumbing, they put it in food, like bad ideas. <laughs> um, but like we've known about lead being uh, you know, in water for a long time. Um, but it hasn't been public knowledge, and there's been forces that, um, special interests that really have made sure that folks in medicine and public health didn't think it was a threat. That when you drank a glass of water, that we, you know, it was assumed to be safe. Uh, so when I heard, you know, when I, when I, it finally dawned on me that there could be lead in water, which is meant for ingestion, like we're not supposed to eat paint chips. Kids do, it's sweet, they do, but we're supposed to drink water. Like water is a medical and public health necessity. Our bodies are like 70% water. Um, so, you know, that kind of propelled me to do the research, which I never should have had to do. You don't have to prove kids are being lead poisoned. <laughs> to stop lead from being in the water, but I knew that I would need data and science to, to move mountains, so. Well, you also had to prove that it was the change in the water yes. source that led to this huge exposure increase with kids. Yes. So, you know, when we talked, you talked a lot about um, building this whole team and a coalition, and when we were watching the video about Anita yeah. and hearing th those people talk about her and, and that vision of leadership, how did you build your team? Oh, that's a great question, Mary. So um, one of the reasons I did not want to write a book is because it's not a story about one person. Um, all of these stories of change, big change, little change, is a story of a village. Um, and often it's a village of sisters, but it's a village of unexpected folks that come together who care about the same thing that you care about. And in, in medicine and in many of our professions, we tend to become siloed and hyper-specialized, and we hang out with a lot of people who maybe have the same kind of profession as us and the same background as us. And I think what I've, I've learned the most throughout this process is how important it is to build a team with different folks. <laughs> um, like my best friend in the story was a water engineer. Like who knew like water people also cared about kids? Like they do, like they absolutely do. And so do <laughs> moms and journalists and pastors and, and activists and lawyers. So. My team was broad and unexpected. And then a, most, the critical part of my team was, was the people, was the, you know, the people of Flint and especially the children of Flint. And when you do work in public health um, and medicine, it's, it's, it's most effective when you do it in humble partnership with the community that you're serving, whether it's global or domestically. So often we come in as academics or you know, with lots of degrees after our name and say, oh, this is what you should be doing. This is how you should be doing it. No, like stop and listen um, and, and, and work collaboratively to do that work. So when you started doing this, one of my favorite parts of the story is that you did all this research and unlike the traditional pathway mm -hmm. of researchers and publishing um, and waiting several months for that, you just went straight to the press, which is a risk. You were talking about taking risks. That was a professional risk. Yes. Um, but it mattered that you did yeah. that. Um, there was a bit of a backlash. Huh. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit about that. And you know, I also enjoy that you sort of gave an ultimatum to some political folks to say, like, I have this information. I'm going public. If you don't deal with me quickly, mm -hmm. so. How did you decide to take that risk and take that leap 
And at what point did you realize the kind of battle you had mm. just entered into? Um, so, like you said, when you're an academic, a physician, when you do research, you publish in, in peer-reviewed journals, you present at conferences. Um, how long does that usually take? Forever. Forever, like months, years. Like it takes a really long time to go through that really important process, that peer review process where your peers check your work and they ask questions and you review and resubmit. It takes forever. Um, but every day that went by was a day that baby bottles were being filled with this poison and sippy cups and glasses of water. And I, I couldn't wait. There was, there was no choice. Um, I've received, as mentioned, so many like, humbling accolades um, throughout the last few years. And, and my favorite was an award that I got from MIT called the Disobedience Award um, <laughs> for being academically disobedient and not going through that peer review process. It was eventually published. You can read it. It was the most cited <laughs> publication that year in the American Journal of Public Health. It was eventually published. But it was a public health emergency. The, 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 we could not wait. So, so it was a risk, and like, but I didn't think it was a risk when I did it. Like, can you guys imagine being in the middle of a public health crisis and not listening to science? Good, it's a joke, it's a joke. So, so when, I shared, when I shared this research, I'm like, I'm just sharing science. Like, I'm sharing numbers and statistics and p-values. Like, how could anybody dispute science, right? Well. Well. <laughs> um, that's not what, I, so that's not, so I felt great for like a half an hour. I'm like, I'm doing my job as a pediatrician because part of my job as a pediatrician is, is an advocate for children, is to speak up for them. Like, that's why I went into this profession. Um, so I'm like, I felt great. I'm like, yay. And then, um, and then I knew it was like, um, it was bigger than me when within a half an hour, um, the state, every arm of the state, the federal government went after me and said I was wrong said that I was causing near hysteria, which is sexist, that I was an unfortunate researcher, that I was splicing, dicing, the list goes on of how they attacked me and they attacked um, my science. So you had a dark moment or two. There was a dark moment, yes. But I felt this big, tiny. But you got back up again. I did. And you know, one of the things that you told me is every day you did another interview. Every day you just kept yeah. pushing the information and yeah. communicating the science. When did you feel like you were making a breakthrough? Yeah. Um, so there was the, you know, the dark low moment, um, and it was hard, you know. And and I was prepared because everybody who'd gone up again, who had said anything about the water, w was dismissed and denied and, and you know, ridiculed. But it's personal, too. But it's personal, you know, and, and um, of great serendipity, um, my brother happens to be a whistleblower lawyer, which I didn't even know <laughs> before this. I thought he was just like an employment lawyer. He, How convenient. Works in, he works in DC, <laughs> he does good work, I don't really know what he does, and he happened to be in town the weekend before I was going public, and he's like, Mona, what's wrong? Like, what, why are, like, why, you know, you seem distracted. I'm like, I'm, I'm doing this research, and I'm showing this, and he's like, Mona, you're a whistleblower. I'm like, there's not, I'm not a whistleblower. There's no way. He's like, he's like, you need to be prepared. Like, they're gonna go after you. I'm like, no, I'm just sharing science. <laughs> so like, people tried to warn me that it was gonna be bad, um, but nothing can prepare you for for that pressure. And like I said, I felt this big. I felt tiny. I felt defeated. I, I told the students earlier today, like, I began to second guess myself. Like, I, you know, I, as so many, I folks I think would, and this kind of imposter syndrome came in, and I began to think, like, who am I? Like, I am, like, barely five foot tall, like a brown immigrant woman going against some of the most powerful forces in the state. Um, but fortunately, whenever the, the imposter syndrome presents, you just, you know, push it back down. Um, but it was about what you said earlier. It was about, it was about something bigger than me. It, was, it wasn't about me. Like, I quickly realized, like, they could go after Mona all they wanted. This was about my kids, my patients, like, people that I'd been entrusted to serve. And that's what kept, kept me going. Um, so we pushed back, and we fought back, and we fought back with science and, and evidence and data, um, and finally had a conversation with a physician at the state, a, like a you know, good doctor to doctor conversation. She's like, I'm sorry, we're going after you, but, but tell me how you did your research. And finally kind of had a back and forth, and, and by then, it was an international story. Um, so I like to say that it was our science that spoke truth to power and, and finally got the state to concede, but I think it was the media. 
Um, and that's why I did every single interview. There was days I had like 16 interviews a day. Um, I, I had lost my voice because I, I was talking and talking so much, trying to bring attention to a story that had been, had been a, you know, had had inattention for a year and a half. So you start to make some progress, mm -hmm. and then the governor wants to bring you in, mm -hmm. right, to mm -hmm. build a solution, which in a way is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but another moment of mine that's a favorite is um, they tried to, I guess, put together a story that was inconsistent with your interpretation of the facts. Mm -hmm. And um, you're up on a stage with the governor and his, his whole group. and Lots of men in suits. Yes. And they start talking about what this looks like or what their impression is and how many people may have been affected. And you're just in the background going like this. I have no poker face. <laughs> but that like was more stardom, right? Mm -hmm. Most people behind a podium with a governor is are going like this, right? Um, and, and it was a vigorous no, as I recall. Um, so then what happened? <laughs> so um, yeah, so they were like lying and misleading and kind of, you know, not sharing the full story at this, it was the first time the governor actually had come to Flint and um, was very apologetic and sincere and I was willing to work with him. I did work with him and, uh, and you know, I, this, I work for kids. My constituency is children. People are like, how can you work with this administration? They should be in jail. I'm like, that, that's, I will, I need to work with this administration in the next five to make sure kids get what they need. So. You know, when you're in this job, you're in it once again for, for others. Um, so they asked me to come to this press conference. They were going to announce some stuff. I'm like, sure, I'll come. I'm happy to help. I want to make sure that kids get what they need and that we can recover. And then it was just, like, not accurate information. And I just happened to be placed, like, almost directly behind the governor. So, like, in line of the camera. And my head was shaking vigorously, <laughs> which got picked up on national television. Um, Googling. Um, Rachel Maddow, who then had me on air that night and said I was a badass. So huge compliment, <laughs> huge, huge compliment. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's about standing up for the truth. Um, I wasn't going to be um, a trophy that they had collected. I wasn't going to be, um, you know, there's this concept of trust transfer. Like if people trust her, then they'll trust, you know, the administration. And I, I wasn't going to let that happen. You know, I was going to do once again what needed to be done for the people that I was privileged to serve. So eventually, the governor even brings in the president. There's a like state of emergency. It's, you know, changes. And just to get to the bottom line, they changed like all of. EPA federal policy. There's like a website that talks about how her work changed team, the entire. A village, a village. Her whole village <laughs> led by her team. No, lots of people, amazing people. <laughs> um, but really changed the whole perspective of the fact that water is a conduit to lead poisoning in certain yeah. circumstances in the country. Laws were passed in many states around the country, yeah. including here in New Jersey, for yeah. testing um, in schools. Yeah. I got a letter. Yeah. home about my kids school having lead in their fountain it's that's everywhere. closed it's mm -hmm. everywhere so it really changed the whole dynamic um but you were still busy in flint trying to figure out recovery so mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about that because it was more than just changing the water source back yeah of course um, so within a few weeks of going public and after the backlash um, eventually the state conceded um, the data that I, I worked on is blood lead data is part of surveillance data. So the state uh, government, the health department had it. So, um, and they actually had seen previously, they, they had also seen a spike, but covered it up. Um, so they, they conceded, yes, you know, our data is consistent with your data, um, admitted fault, and then, you know, began the long work of recovery, which I, you know, I continue to do to this day. With something like lead, you're supposed to practice uh, what's called primary prevention. You're never supposed to expose kids to lead. Um, so our next step is secondary prevention. What can we do to mitigate the impact of the crisis? 
And that's what our work has been every day, is throwing every single thing that we can think of at our children to improve uh, their health and de development, to mitigate the impact of this crisis. So we've built amazing things in Flint. We have Medicaid expansion, trauma-informed care, nutrition prescriptions, massive expansion of early literacy, 24-hour um, crisis lines, uh, you know, the list goes on and on, brand new child care centers, home visiting programs. Uh, we have a Flint registry, which I run, which is CDC funded, that follows folks and then gets them connected to these services. So really awesome things um, that we've put into place to mitigate this. Um, but, but you're right, you know, our story, my story, this book, it's not about this one city over here. It's really about kids everywhere who wake up with some of the same kinds of toxicities who are poisoned by some of the same injustices, be it environmental or, or racial or you know, from lost democracy to systemic inequities. There's lots of kids, poverty, that wake up um, you know, as you know, where their potential is also blunted. Um, so we've been able to kind of shine a light nationally on that, not just on lead. I think our biggest successes has been um, the recent Infrastructure Act. Um, I had the, the honor of testifying um, two times, the last two times, about the Federal Infrastructure Act, which invests in roads and broadband and bridges, but it also has the largest investment um, in water infrastructure, including $15 billion to replace lead pipes across the country. It's not all the money that's needed, but it's, it's huge. It's a big deal um, to finally eliminate this straw, this poisonous straw that was delivering water to millions of kids everywhere. Um, so it's been this you know, amazing opportunity to not only work on Flint's recovery, and we have a long way to go. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of issues. There's grant writing every day. There's you know, um, research and, you know, and community building and trust building, because trust is severed. There's a lot of work that you know, is part of our recovery, um, but there's a lot of awesome ripple effects that we've been able to do all over um, to improve the health of children ev everywhere. So one of the things that you talked about were the moms in the community, and I think you just called them these amazing moms, yeah. and they were moms of kids that were being affected yeah. by the water, but also became advocates for their yeah. community. Um, Anita was a mom, too, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think that one of the things that I want to have you talk about a little bit is why do you think these moms make such strong and powerful and formidable advocates in public health? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, and it's, it is a history of that, like especially in environmental stories, like um, Lewis Gibbs, Aaron Brockovich, like these amazing, uh, in Flint we had so many moms. Like the moms were smarter than the EPA. Like there was a Flint mom that discovered the water wasn't being treated properly. She's the one that contacted this water scientist that came up and did citizen science to test the water. Uh, when the EPA finally came in, when we were a federal emergency, she taught the EPA how to sample for lead and water. Like our m moms are amazing. And it's, like, it's as if they're fighting for their own children, but they quickly shift to fighting for every kid. Um, it's this protectiveness. It's a superpower that moms have. It is this gift <laughs> that we have um, that, that, never, that, that I think empowers us and enables us to do what is seemingly impossible. So I'm going to open it up for questions, and there's a microphone in the middle. But for those of you who are thinking, I'm going to ask one more question. Um, and I totally agree with you on the mom advocate yes. thing. I tell my, I have three boys, and I tell them, watch out for mama bear. <laughs> yeah, because when mama bear comes they, out, there is nothing that she cannot they conquer. They for the wrong moms, um, yeah, for sure. But, you know, one of the other um, things that you have done that's been so inspiring, I think, is really to inspire so many of the young physicians in training. Um, I shared with you my sister is a pediatrician, and she's still in her training. And we hear so much about sort of the burnout, in particular mm -hmm. in the context of the past few years as well, of our physician, nursing, healthcare workforce more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, and they hear this story, and they're learning it in med school, in the good med schools. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure Rutgers is teaching it. <laughs> um, and I think that you know, they see this, this physician who is busy caring for patients, a mom caring for her family, um, but going that extra mile and not just moving on to the next patient and doing the note, but like changing the world. So what do you say 
to those um, healthcare providers that are in the field and feeling that. <sighs> yeah, and I, I guess I would say to an even broader audience, um, you know, a lot of us go into our professions to serve. Uh, those of us that go into medicine or public health or law, any profession, it's, it's, it's to make the world a better place, right? To, to, to heal, to protect, um, to kind of optimize the potential, uh, to eliminate disparities, improve equity. So there's, you know, there's, a, there's reasons why so many of us choose to do what we do, like, like Anita who's driven to make the world a better place. And in some professions, that gets beaten out of us uh, through training, through work hours, through toxic cultures. And, and folks forget you know, why, why they went into these very service-driven professions. Um, when the water crisis was exposed and they did all these investigations, the folks at the water department, um, they, they, the part of the, the, um, the recovery that the folks at the water department had to do, or part of their kind of homework, was that they had to retake intro to public health classes. <laughs> to, to remind them, like, why you are in the office of drinking water. It's not for minimal compliance and rubber stamping. It's for safe drinking water and public health and, and protecting people. Um, so, you know, I love to share this story um, so that it can serve as a, as a playbook um, for, for folks to recognize that they too can keep their eyes open to injustices that they also have the power to act, and it doesn't mean you have to be a doctor. Uh, it's about everyday people um, f you know, seeing something wrong in their community and being, taking a risk and being brave enough to do something about it. Uh, so you know, this is a David and Goliath story. This is about going against the impossible, and, and it worked. It worked because of persistence. It worked because of teamwork. Um, it worked because, you know, our, we were driven by you know that that passion to make the world a better place. So you know, let you know when when times are down and you feel beat down. I, I hope this serves as a story of if she can do it, I can do it. And that's why you know in my in my book I, I include so much personal in there. I talk about being a mom and missing soccer practices and going to Girl Scout meetings and neglecting my husband and balancing a career. <laughs> like we are juggling a bazillion <laughs> balls in the air and things fall and that's okay. That's totally okay. Um, but I put that, all that in there to be relatable. I am just like you. Um, and if I can do this, you can do this. So I do have some pre-submitted questions, but as a reward for all of you for being here live and in person, if you do have a question, please come up to the microphone in the middle and free, feel free to ask. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Douglas Cantor. I'm a member of the political science department here. Um, there was a moment when you were speaking to state legislators in Michigan where you said, uh, it was a famous quote during everything you said, uh, Flint was poisoned by policy. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could elaborate mm -hmm. a little bit on that and also if, um, I guess, your take on uh, current uh, mm -hmm. lead crises uh, throughout mm -hmm. the country, particularly Benton Harbor, mm -hmm. Jackson, Newark, mm -hmm. if you think that statement also applies to those places as well. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so he teaches a water politics course, so he's got a, a he's, he knows. <laughs> um, so uh, we, have, we have to cover a little history, and history is important, and my, my book has a, is full of history. I was taught to really understand kind of where we are and how to move forward. We have to start by looking back. So we're going to make this a little audience participat participatory. So <laughs> what, what, what was Flint famous for like a long, long time ago, like a century ago? Cars. cars, General Motors. General <laughs> Motors was born in Flint, right? And um, and does anybody know else? Shortly after cars were being made, Flint was famous for something else. Be the auto workers unions, the UAW. So the auto workers went on strike. It was a famous strike. It was called the sit down strike. They're like, wait a minute, this company's making a lot of money, but we're not. And when we make blue cars, we're coughing up blue that night, and we're losing digits, and we have to work really hard. So they went on strike demanding fair wages and occupational health and safety and pensions and all these things that people are still fighting for now. 
Um, and, and they won after 44 days. Their, 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 their union was recognized and the UAW was born. So more importantly than Flint being the birthplace of cars, Flint was also the birthplace of the middle class in America. The very first subdivision in America was in Flint. So Flint was like this promised land for a long time. I'm gonna to get to your answer real quickly. So Flint <laughs> so it was a place of prosperity, and not even that long ago, 1980s, Flint had the highest per capita income in the country. Like that's crazy, like not long ago, Flint was the richest city in the country. And then what, what, then what happened to Flint, does anybody know? The plans closed, so disinvestment. Automation, globalization, greed, capitalism, I don't know. So plans <laughs> closed, jobs were lost, and people who had the power and the privilege to leave the city left. White flight, okay? So the, the city became increasingly segregated. Uh, historic racist real estate practices made it really hard for some people to leave the city. Uh, efforts to regionalize the city failed mainly because of racist reasons. And that left the city starving with a population that um, couldn't support infrastructure anymore, couldn't support policing, couldn't support public health. Uh, so the city was near bankrupt, uh, near bankrupt, so in crisis for decades before the water crisis because of these policies that left it so, um, so poor with uh, lack of revenue sharing, high rates of poverty, every disparity you can think of. And then the, the policy that was the worst was um, we were near bankrupt and the state took over the city. We were under emergency management. And um, I, I need to share this because this, this is really important. It, it reminds us that uh, Flint's a democracy story and it reminds us that when you corrode democracy, people get sick. Uh, against the will of the people, this emergency manager law passed. It was, it was on a ballot. The people of Michigan said, we don't want emergency managers. But our legislature, which used to be one of the most gerrymandered legislatures, it's not after Tuesday, so <laughs> amazing. So our legislature pushed it through against the will of the people. And all of a sudden, we had the state taking over cities all over, um, majority minority cities. At one point in Michigan, half of our African-American population was under emergency management compared to just 2% of our white population. National media were on the Flint story before we changed our water, just when we were a democracy story. Like this is weird, like unelected, unaccountable officials are running so many cities and, and governing like by austerity. Like they're just, it's all about cutting costs, cutting costs, no regard to, to, to health or, or the environment. So that is the policy, many policies, but that is the acute policy that literally poisoned the city because it was their decision that changed our water source. Um, so I, you know, that's an important part of the story because it's not some random thing that happened in Michigan where they, they usurp democracy. It's happening all over. You know, efforts that are about you know, voter ID laws and, and gerrymandering and voter suppression, mass incarceration, all those, all their, those are all efforts that also take away majority minority voices from participating in democracy. <laughs> Which is really exciting. So there's a movement in public health and medicine now, the civic health movement, um, where um, voting is, is recognized as a social determinant of health. So the American Medical Association, the NMA National Medical Association, which is the Black Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics has just identified as one of the most recent social determinants of health, voting. So now when we are with patients, we're supposed to say, are you wearing your seatbelt? Did you get your vaccine? Are you registered to vote? Like, how awesome is that? I don't think it's widespread yet, but it is a growing movement recognizing the role of democracy and voter participation in health. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Yes. Hi, okay. Um, I'm Primed, I'm studying a class in global poverty and this is relating to the question you just answered. Um, something we see over and over in both foreign intervention and domestic interventions, like what happened in Flint, is the bigger entities always come in with, or nearly always come in with an approach of, we know what we're doing, we're right, and we can manage things better for you. 
whether you is Jamaica or Micronesia or Flint, Michigan. Um, and yet that's not always the case. And I guess my question is just um, if from the people you've interacted with, with and worked with, you've also talked about EPA people who were acknowledging the issue. Like what's the difference between people who are willing to admit the flaws in the systems they own and run and the people and entities that are more protective and more sure of themselves to such an extent that they'll crush you even though you have irrefutable evidence that kids are being poisoned. Oh, what's your name? Or. Or? Or, great question. Do you want to answer it? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's hard. So the folks that work in these bureaucracies are good people. They're, they're, they, they are in it for the right reasons. Um, but Mostly. They, most of them. But they are, they don't have the, enough resources. They've been victims of decades of austerity, attacks on big government that have left their, you know, that have left them, you know, with skeleton crews able to protect water and protect public health. We chronically disinvest in public health. I, I hope that everybody has learned that during the pandemic. We don't invest in what keeps people healthy. Um, and you know, in Flint, it, the surveillance systems, the water infrastructure in the pandemic, you know, local health departments, state health departments, we couldn't, we, there was no way we could ramp up testing and, you know, and vaccine delivery. We just didn't have the capacity. And I think it's important to recognize that this is not by accident. Um, you know, there have been so many special interests who purposefully want public health to be weak. Uh, who you know attack science, attack scientists, instill doubt in science, and make it near impossible to strengthen regulations because it impacts their bottom line. Um, so this is not by accident that we're in this place where public health is reactive rather than what it should be is in, which is proactive. Um, and when it's proactive, it can you know it can identify problems and it can fix problems. But right now we're chasing crisis after crisis without pausing to invest in what keeps people healthy. Um, you know, we spend, you're pre-med, we spend so much money on healthcare. We spend a lot of money on healthcare. But the return on investment is not great. We have terrible, uh, you know, public health, you know, metrics, uh, life expectancy, infant mortality, it's terrible. We don't spend money on what keeps people healthy. Uh, things like, um, universal child allowances, like let's cross our fingers, the child tax credit gets renewed. Uh, things like, you know, health care that's not related to employment, stronger environmental regulations, robust public health infrastructure, uh, increasing the minimum wage, paid parental leave. Like these are things that are standards in other countries that keep people healthy. Yet we operate on a sickness-based system. We spend money taking care of people once they're already sick. Um, my, one of my favorite quotes is by uh, Frederick Douglass, who said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Uh, we do a lot of repairing of broken men. I think the only thing I would add to that is so frequently when you look at government spending, it's pitting one thing against another. Yeah, it's the worst. And so, you know, in the context of even one of the things that I think it was a great thing was, you know, the Affordable Care Act, the expansion of Medicaid. It was not necessarily reforming this payment system, which pays for, um, you know, the delivery of service when someone's sick. And there was very little, if any, investment in the public health prevention system. And even when they called it prevention, it was paying for primary care visits, not mm -hmm. that sort of public investment mm -hmm. in a public system. So we yeah. have to do more of that. Absolutely. Um, any other questions from the audience? Yes. Come on up. <laughs> Hi, I want to preface this with my request to not be photographed. Thank you. Um, hello, Mona. I was fascinated when listening to your testimony how dedicated you were to allocating time to research um, while you were a mother. Uh, I recently watched this documentary on Hulu called Fair Play, and it's a it's a adaptation of a book that was written by Eve Rodsky, talking about the division of labor, um, 
predicated on gender between like heterosexual couples or even like queer couples. And I wanted to know if you found that after your research, after your media outreach phase, after it all kind of simmered down, did it revert back to its like regular split or did it change? Like was it a more permanent, tangible thing that changed in your household or did it revert back? <laughs> Great questions. Um, so, I mean, I'm here today, I'm not home, my husband's in charge of everything today. Um, and, you know, sometimes, like, I do more family stuff and sometimes he does. Um, but I've also made sure that there's lots of support systems in place uh, to help us do our work. He's also a pediatrician. Um, who you know who who has a full time job and and it's hard that balance is 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 really really hard so you know I was away for a long time I was not home there was a probably a good yearish plus when you know even after the water crisis was exposed it was advocacy it was speaking it was going to D C it was lobbying it was all this work and I was rarely home. Um, uh, and you know, other folks. You know, my kids were still well loved and taken care of, for and, um, and and then COVID happened, right? And and I was grounded, and and um, I was with my kids a lot, you know. <laughs> and then they're like, "Mom, when are you going back to work?" <laughs> um, so it was a it was a blessing to be to be home and, and to be able to do things remotely, and, and you know, as all of us were. Um, but it's it's a balance. There's, there's ups and downs. It's a struggle every single day. Um, if you have found a couple that's made it work, let me know. It, there's a lot of helping hands. I, I I told the students earlier, like before I had kids, I was like like hardcore feminist. I'm like I can do everything. I am a superwoman. I don't need anybody's help. Like I got this. And then like after having kids, I'm like yes, come over, bring bring food, bring laundry, help with my laundry. <laughs> So ask for help. I've gotten really good at just asking for help. Uh, you know, you need a village, and my village, I call them my village of sisters. Like, I have lots of people I lean on, aunts and babysitters and, you know, grandparents. I can't. It's impossible. It takes a village to raise children, it's just little <laughs> kids. Like, it's really, really hard, um, and you need as, as much help as possible and, and, and be humble enough to, to ask for help, and I do all the time. And I fail. I fail all the time. I, I, like, I missed my kids' parent-teacher conferences the other day. I just missed. I totally forgot. Like, and I, I'm, like, I'm so sorry. Um, I, miss, I, I miss Girl Scout meetings and soccer games. But I'll, tell, I'll, I'll end with a, a quote from my, my daughter. So it was at the peak of the crisis. And I used to be at everything. I used to be at I was the assistant coach of their soccer team. Terrible. Like, I, I went to every Girl Scout meeting. Like, I tried to be there for my kids. And my eight-year-old at the time, was talking to her eight-year-old bestie, and the other girl was like, where's your mom? Like, your mom was always around. Like, what, what happened to your mom? And my daughter said, mom's taking care of our 6,000 siblings. <laughs> <laughs> and the only thing that I want to add to that is, Mona and I have so many things in common, it's sort of strange, um, but we both have benefited from our own mothers yeah. helping us. Absolutely. Um, and one of the comments you wrote in your book was that your mom helps you raise your children. She and does. my Absolutely. mom helps me raise my children. Yeah. And I don't think it would have been, Impossible. my life has not been possible without my mom Yeah. Um, to this day. Yeah. So I day. feel very, very lucky. My mom buys my clothes still. <laughs> I, I, hate, I hate shopping. I hate shopping. Not all my clothes, but, you know, but still. Um, and not everybody has that. And so I, I'm blessed, I just, blessed. with Thanksgiving next week, I just want to say thank you to yes. my mom. Call your mom um, if you can. But, um, or, or pay tribute to your mom. But, um, and, and then you can have all these 6,000 siblings. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, I want to bring us to a close. Um, I, I don't know about you, but this has been, I've talked to you before, and this is just a wonderful conversation. I've so enjoyed it, um, so authentic, so real, um, and sharing both personal and professional pride um, and accomplishment and sharing that with all the people that you've got on this journey with. Um, it's so inspirational. And um, you know what Anita brought to us um, and what her family continues 
to share with us through these conversations is inspirational um, and really helps us go out there and keep trying to make the world a better place. So thank you, thank you Mona. Thank you.